Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Search Podcast. So, uh, for today's episode, I wanted to talk about uh, closed chest compressions or CPR, as we know it now. Um, the concept began in the 1960s. Prior to that, it was a big deal uh, to perform any sort of cardiac resuscitation, uh, especially if it was actually a pure cardiogenic shock situation, because the only effective quote unquote chest compressions were done as open chest compressions in which you'd have to do a direct uh, open cardiac massage. But uh, in the 1960s, there was a JAMA article that showed a 70% permanent survival rate, which dwarfed anything that was being done at the time. It made it into the single most important thing to do uh, in, in, in resuscitation. And, you know, yes, 70% survival rate, but when you read the actual paper, it was only 20 patients. And so, therefore, I would not have come to the same conclusions as the authors did, saying anyone, anywhere can now initiate cardiac resuscitative procedures. All that is needed is two hands. Uh, that led to an extremely strong push, partly because at the time there was no big data, but also because of the fact that, in general, people weren't comfortable opening chests. And they shouldn't be for every single cardiac arrest. It should be reserved for specific indications, which I'll probably get to a little bit later today. But in general, you know, by 1965, it was there was a moratorium on thoracotomies in the emergency room. And doctors were told to prevent death by compressing the chest as long as they could for as long as they could. This eventually led to us giving drugs consistently with it, uh, such as epinephrine and atropine. I think people still use atropine during CPR, which I find a little bit kooky, but again, to each his own, unless there are very specific times when I would. But in general, there was a universal paradigm shift that, that made doing things like ED thoracotomies the wrong thing to do and made CPR into something that was very easy to perform and very easy to adapt. And, you know, I'll be honest, and I think that you would agree with me that the literature does not support a 70% survival rate. So... Yes, the, the patient sample size was small, but I would think that there was just a, a bit of a patient selection bias going on somewhere because we have a, a variability in outcomes despite being better at CPR. And it is difficult to study with meaningful endpoints. And, you know, because there aren't any meaningful endpoints, it leads to an overall suboptimal performance and feedback loop during CPR. Because I don't have things that I can measure. I don't have things that I can optimize, at least effectively. And so advanced resuscitation becomes a, a very much a bottleneck. And there are scenarios where you genuinely want to try. Like you, you cannot come to grips with the idea that this patient's not doing well right now and is in a cardiac arrest situation. Uh, scenarios like witnessed cardiac events. Uh, younger patients who come in with a toxidrome that has led to a CPR situation. Uh, indications for thoracotomies, penetrating head and neck injuries, uh, penetrating injuries to the abdomen that have led to a hemorrhagic shock. All of these things push you towards performing CPR. But the problem is that what we're doing is a standardized version of CPR. And whenever I've seen the standardized version, there are places that do it better than others. There are places that simply can't do it. They're not performing CPR adequately, and so therefore uh, it's felt that the prognosis is very poor because the patient's getting CPR, which it is to an extent. But there's always room for improvement. And so for today's episode, I want to talk about full throttle CPR, how to perform better CPR, more targeted CPR, and what things matter based on the modern literature, right, in order to produce better outcomes. Again, we're not going to talk about um, how how to put in an IV line. We're not going to talk about these things. We're not going to talk about when to use an IO and when to put in an IV necessarily. We're going to talk about full throttle, all out, flat out, directly, openly, full speed, bluntly, full bore, peak performance, wide open, never tap out CPR. We're going to talk about those cases where you want to push all the way through. And the first thing that you need to do to be able to activate it is to be able to predict it. So whenever my patients have a consistent systolic below 60, despite vasopressors, a heart rate below 30, despite resuscitation al algorithms being activated adequately, a saturation below 50 that's not picking up, no drive to breathe at all, 
or a pH below 7, not necessarily in the context of DKA, just in general, those are patients where I'm going to call for CPR early. I'm going to say the patient's going to rest, get the crash cart. And I will activate my team. And that's what it brings me to next. In regular context, bystander pre-hospital CPR, regular context, not advanced, but regular context, a two-person team working in unison and in synchrony is adequate because you can't put in IV lines. You can't intubate a patient. You don't have the utilities that you do in the hospital. And because you only have to do it for a short period of time until the paramedics show up. In advanced CPR algorithms and in advanced in-hospital CPR with maximal aggression, you're going to need three RNs, one cart commando. And all that person's job is to set up the cart, move things from the cart onto the patient. An IV wizard. That's your second nurse. That nurse has to be able to either get an IV or communicate the need for an IO and activate that. Or communicate the need for a central line and activate that. And a documentation czar that's also capable of balancing out the room and optimizing communication when need be. You also need to have an RT that's comfortable with giving one breath for every 20 chest compressions and will use end tidal CO2. And you need two to three doctors. Yes, two to three doctors. You need one code leader. You need one access pulse, pulse check POCUS officer, somebody who can do all three or two out of the three, depending on your point of view on the use of ultrasound in these cases. And you're going to need one attending. Uh, you know, there, there should be an attending in the room, not to direct the code necessarily, but to direct where we go after the code and to coordinate that at attending level to optimize the ability to move the patient to the cath lab, to optimize the ability to get blood for the patient urgently, to optimize the ability to get the surgeon if you're not the surgeon, or to get the intensivist if you're not the intensivist but you're part of the code team. That's why you need the attending in the room or at least be present. So when you count the total number, that's 10 people. That's a lot of people because you also need three people to perform chest compressions who will swap out after every 200. I, I see these people try to be heroes by, by doing chest compressions for 10 minutes straight. You just become extremely tired and the last five minutes of your chest compressions will be suboptimal. Either the rate will be too low or the depth will not be good enough. And so just to summarize, you're going to have an RT at the top of the bed doing one breath for every 20 compressions. You're going to have three compression uh, team that will do optimal chest compressions, count till 20 every single time, and switch after cycle of 200. During their switch, you're going to have RNs that can establish IV access and a code card guru who can give a DC shock if required and prompted by the group leader at compression number 200. To do that, at compression number 180, the team leader has to get them to get that ready. You're going to need the team leader to be able to ensure that everything is of high quality and that everybody's on the same page. And you're going to need to have a pulse check MD who can also be able to insert any other IV access that is required and perform a point of care ultrasound as well as other procedures. That MD, that second MD at the bedside, should have the finger on the pulse at beat number 180 ready to feel at beat 200. By compression number 200, Boom, it has to be in there, okay? The same MD can help the RT with any airway issues if required. And you have the RN that's a recorder and the attending. The attending will keep the room quiet, will do some crowd control. But the attending's main role here, in my opinion, contrary to what's on the slide, is to be able to optimize where this patient is going to go next and optimize other services involvement. Because as you know, with an attending around, things go a little bit faster, if only because they know how to conduct themselves. The next point is speed. So there's a whole bunch of literature on measuring the time to something and cardiac arrest outcomes. So time to recognizing the arrest and doing CPR, fairly obvious. You don't need good data for this. It's intuitive. Time to establishment of a temporary airway such as an LMA does help. It does help. I know that in my LMA Shower Thoughts episode, I'll include a link if you're on YouTube. I did say that, you know, it may change the cardiac output situation to an extent. It does. There is some animal data that proves that it does, at least in animals. But you need to establish some sort of airway that's definitive. Okay. The time to defibrillation has an outcome measure that is extremely important. 
it improves neurological outcomes and improves survivals and improves rates of temporary ROSC. The time to vasopressors, yes, the time to vasopressors and the use of vasopressors has been independently associated with better neurological outcomes and better rates of discharge. The one thing that people tend to do very quickly that has no effect on overall outcome is the time to use a POCUS. You can use POCUS if you want. You can use point of care ultrasound if you want for multiple reasons. I think it's an excellent tool. But for you to be able to use it, it has to be done after the priorities are addressed. That will maintain some sort of perfusion and some sort of oxygenation and some sort of gas exchange. The next part is going to be coordination. So what I mean by coordination is there have to be goals within the 200 compression window. So the goals are to start CPR and start counting out loud for the person doing the compressions. The LMA bag mask, one breath for 20 compressions, and preparing and attaching the drugs and monitors to patients. This should be done during the first two 200th chest compression. And then during the pulse check, there should be a swap of the person doing the compressions, a consideration and possible intubation, and you only have that 10 second pulse check and a pulse check and central access if not already done. At that point, you need to resume your 200 compressions and that's the way that it has to be coordinated. Then during the compression check, you can reassess the need for intubation if you can get that tube in, swap compressors, do the pulse check and so on and so forth. And it has to be very well coordinated. And I would say the number one piece of software, I wish I could study this. I wish that there was a way to design a study, but the number one piece of software that helps me out with this is an interval trainer software. So it does split times for workouts. And what I do is that I set it up for about a two minute split time because I'm counting that it's gonna be between 100 to 120 chest compressions a minute as my target. So about a two minute uh, workout and I do 10 sets. So that's a total of 20 minutes with a 10 second rest. And I set it to vibrate and it's in my pocket the whole time that I'm doing this whole thing and that we're doing the CPR and I feel it vibrate when it's time for a pulse check and then I feel it vibrate a second time when it's time for us to resume. I have used it as an alarm as well. In some places it helps, in some places the room is just too noisy and it doesn't. In terms of compression, so compression rate has to be between 100 and 125 per minute. It, it can't be less than that, okay? And if it is more than that, then it's gonna be suboptimal. The depth has to be between four and five millimeters you know, it's very hard to do, but it should be done that way. There is no maximal compression depth, but there's no utility in breaking somebody's ribs for no reason. Another thing to note is that during chest compressions, having the head down by 30 degrees may help perfusion to an extent. Having them supine is more safe and better. This is just a, um, a physiology review that quoted a couple of pieces of data from different studies. So the compression depth is the more important part of that slide and the compression rate as opposed to the head position. The supine position is fairly adequate, it's just there for interest. When you look at compression depth, there is no ceiling to the depth, and there is some variability in to how much mileage you get out of comp chest compressions. I believe that that's because we have different body habituses and different uh, thoracic anatomy, and so therefore a, a thorax that's shaped more optimally, will you'll get more cardiac output than one that isn't in general and that might lead to better survival to discharge. Similarly with rates. So anything between 100 and 125 is probably the most optimal rate for improved survival. And that's why I'm a fan of the Lucas device in certain centers where I know that I don't have enough people and I don't have enough people who were well-trained enough and familiar enough to perform adequate chest compressions. I know that everybody should be well-trained. But in a situation where um, you are in a new center, a new ICU, you've rapidly expanded your services for multiple reasons or things like that, I would not expect everybody to perform perfect CPR. I would expect somebody with a CCU background to be able to do it, somebody with an ICU background to be able to do it, but not an R1 who just started, for example, and not an RN who used to be in obstetrics, for example, and just moved to the ICU. I would expect them to require Lucas device, at least temporarily, to help them out. So I, I, I'm going to be honest, the outcomes aren't that different, whether you use automatic chest compression devices or not. 
in real world scenarios uh, in the quoted literature, but in the institutions where I feel I don't have enough people to be able to provide a three compression coup, or I, I feel that the efficiency of the CPR can be improved, I, I do tend to uh, advocate for the Lucas device or, or automatic uh, chest compression um, device. Now, point of care ultrasound. I am not for or against point of care ultrasound. I have various papers that have come out over the past couple of years, and many of them have either been equivocal or have said to use it for specific things. And in cardiac stencil, you can use it to prognosticate after you've started CPR, so during your first pulse check, if you have any cardiac activity or not. In a shockable arrhythmia or a shockable rhythm, you can confirm the arrhythmia to an extent because you can see how the heart is behaving in rapid motion. You can also confirm the effect of the shock. So you can confirm what, why is it happening? Why is it so profound? Is there that much blood in the abdomen? Is there a pneumothorax? You can look for these things in the cause of the arrest. And you can, to an extent, after the second or third cycle, probably get a better idea as to whether or not this person might benefit from, say, vasopressors. Because you're not going to be able to do a complete ultrasound. You're going to have to try and fit in different parts of your algorithm, be it rush, fast, or a formal echo. You're going to have to fit it in between chest compressions. So it's going to be two-minute intervals. You're going to be ready around about 180 count, just when you have those 20 seconds left or even less than that, like 10 seconds left before you get to jump in, you're going to have your machine set up, you're going to have all your settings done, and you're going to go boom and go right into position as they're doing the pulse check and get that IVC distensibility or get that contractility or get something else that you need or get that renal angle. Do not try and push people out of the way to do the ultrasound because despite papers advocating for its use for prognostication, there haven't been any good papers that say that the outcomes are much better with ultrasound. There are papers that say that in institutions where ultrasound is used, the survival rates are significantly higher, and the ROSC rates are significantly higher. But the neurological outcomes have not been very well elucidated. So centers where ultrasound is used have quoted higher rates of ROSC. That's probably an overall better quality of code team situation. And, you know, again, I can't emphasize this enough. Use that pulse check. A compression 200, you get a pulse check, use it. Next, we need to talk about post-CPR. So post-CPR is a situation that I think a lot of places do badly. You have a patient who has had a total body ischemic reperfusion injury, who has had derangements in physiology that have been fairly prolonged, and who needs a cath. And you've just gotten rusk, and now you've decided to call for an angio. Now, that doesn't work. Okay, So you have to be ready to start an insulin drip. You have to start early vasopressors like we talked about early, earlier, or, or vasopressors and ion tropes like we talked about earlier. You have to have already given the cath lab a heads up that you're doing CPR for a patient who might need a cath. Your CT scan a heads up that you are doing CPR for a patient that may have had an intracranial hemorrhage or a stroke or a massive PE. You're, you should already be able to give a heads up to your surgeon that there's this guy with a distended abdomen and you know he's arresting and it looks either septic or hemorrhagic. There's a little bit of fluid in the abdomen so it doesn't explain as a hemorrhagic shock and your surgeon has to be ready to do a diagnostic laparoscopy or an X-lap or something. It has to be that way. The cath lab, the surgeons, the radiologists, the people who are going to support this patient need to get the heads up the minute you start CPR. And the best person to do that is the attending. That's first part of post-CPR. Second part of post-CPR is glycemic control. The number of times that I've had somebody get ROSC and then have a blood sugar 23 and nobody actually bothered to look at it on the blood gas happens at least four out of ten times. Number three, be aware they're going to be hyperkalemic. There is going to be a lot of electrolyte derangement. And the reason for the electrolyte derangement is because of the fact that they have an ischemic reperfusion injury. So hydrate them well and check the electrolytes regularly. Then, these patients are usually hypothermic post-arrest. They're not hyperthermic. There are exceptions, but they're hypothermic. Targeting a temperature between 33 and 36 seems to be what's reported on either side of the Atlantic. 
I quite frankly target something that's around about normal 36 is the lowest I go. I do, I'm not very convinced that outcomes are better at 33 in terms of active cooling. So 36 is the lowest I'll go for a prolonged downtime. And lastly, be prepared in 72 hours to be able to give an actual prognosis on this patient with all of your answers there. If you've done CPR for a patient, within 72 hours, you have to have a good explanation for why the patient arrested and a good explanation for the patient's outlook. Because if the outlook isn't good, neurologically, then you have an organ donor and you have a limited window of stability to be able to produce an organ donor. So in conclusion, organize yourself into teams. Try and get 10 people. It's hard, but try and get 10 people around, okay? Nine including the attending, so that's 10. Speed, time to vasopressors, time to defibrillation, time to airway, time to CPR, obviously makes a huge difference in terms of neurological outcome. Coordination. Get ready to think in cycles of 200. Use a split timer. Piece of software, absolutely free, used for workouts. Makes you look like you're a Zen master, right? Compression rates, 100 to 125, 5 millimeter depth is the minimum. Take a break after 200. You will fatigue. You will not be able to produce the outcomes that you want. Point of care ultrasound can be used. In places where it is used, the outcomes are overall better, but it should be used after the first cardiac cycle, after the first compression cycle. So at compression number 200 during the pulse check. And pace your ultrasound so that it's split up between intervening pulse checks. Post CPR care is extremely important. The time to think about post CPR care is the time that you've initiated CPR out. The minute you start CPR is the minute that you're getting answers to questions and you're making decisions that may not be based on complete answers, but these decisions are extremely important. If you have a cardiac condition, the time to cath post CPR makes a profound difference. If you have a hemorrhagic shock, the time to getting them to the OR makes a huge difference. If you have a septic shock, the time to antibiotics and to locating the septic shock and draining the pus or doing something of that nature is extremely important. Obviously, a pneumothorax should be treated at the bedside if that's the situation. These things make a huge difference. And preparing for what happens after ROSC is extremely important. In addition to, obviously, glycemic control, um, normal thermia, or even mild active cooling, and things like that. This is Saud Azid. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, it's been a while. Let me know what your tips are for CPR. What types of things have you adopted? Some of it is dogma, some of it is a personal opinion. The literature is all out there, and it's one of those fields that I think the tenets are going to stay. I don't think that we're going to go back to doing ED thoracotomies just to do open chest compression in general. I think it'll still be trauma's domain, and it's not going to extend outside of the trauma patient. But what are your feelings on, on other things to do with CPR? controversies and things like that. If you're not bored, please like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, my name is Saud Azaid, and thank you for listening.